Well, hello, everyone. My name is Darren DeVivo, and I want to welcome you to the uh, latest edition of Things We Said Today, a Beatle podcast in which we talk about everything and anything Beatles, solo Beatles, Beatle families, etc., etc. It's all uh, part of what we do here at Things We Said Today. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Again, I'm Darren DeVivo. I'm from WFUV in New York City at 90.7 FM and online at WFUV.org. Also, uh, we have an app, and you can listen there on the WFUV app. I'm not alone. I have my friends Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen with me. And uh, Ken, you know from uh, his radio show, Every Little Thing, and he's been in broadcasting for years now, <laughs> and uh, also part of uh, the relatively new Talk More Talk video podcast, ladies and gentlemen, Ken Michaels. Hi, Darren. Hi, everybody. And uh, Alan, uh, somewhere out there to the right in cyberspace, Alan Cozen, the author of the books The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something... How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And also uh, a writer who just recently uh, reviewed uh, one of the uh, items we're going to talk about in today's show. Alan Cozen is with us as well. How are you, Alan? Okay, Darren. How are you? And that does it for today's show. Uh, (laughs) Just kidding. But anyway, so we uh, have, uh, we're now into October. We just passed John Lennon's, uh, what would have been his 78th birthday, the day, which was yesterday. We're recording this the day after uh, to do a little math. And you know that it's October 10th as we record this now. And several days ago, we had the release of the Imagine album in multiple forms, box set, remixes, eight track mixes and, uh, and the like. And, uh, of course, we're still uh, uh, enjoying Egypt Station and anticipating the release of the White Album set. Before we get on to uh, all of the fun stuff, I do want to make mention of some sad news. We were all stunned at the sudden uh, news that uh, Jeff Emmerich, the legendary recording engineer uh, who worked with the Beatles starting in 1966, I always say he was sort of George Martin's right-hand man uh, in a way. He suddenly passed from what I understand was a massive heart attack. Uh, we all have, have crossed paths with Jeff Emmerich uh, over the years, going back to when his book uh, was published in, I believe, 2006. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he'd been very visible in recent years, uh, making the rounds, interviews, making appearances, uh, continuing to work in the music industry. And then suddenly we found out that he was no longer with us. Uh, so I uh, guess we can dedicate the show to Jeff Emmerich. Ken and Alan, your thoughts on, on the life and career of Jeff Emmerich? I guess uh, alphabetical order, Alan, you first. Okay. Um, yeah, Jeff was going to be at the White Album Symposium at Monmouth University in New Jersey in uh, about a month. Um, so, you know, he was one of the listed speakers so that that was a shock for that reason too because we all thought we'd sort of get to see him um i i interviewed him in 1995 when the anthology was being put together and he did the mixes for that uh george martin chose the material and he did the mixes uh I, i what i found was a little odd was that he couldn't remember a lot about the Beatles actual sessions and things um, and uh, so you know that wasn't really reassuring in, in terms of uh, the memoir coming out a decade later uh, and it turned out that some of the other EMI engineers who were interviewed by his collaborator Howard Massey uh, complained that apart from things that Howard Massey got wrong that a, a lot of their stories had somehow become Jeff's stories, even when Jeff wasn't actually at the event that they described. Since they also said that they understood that they were there to supplement Jeff's memory and to supply, you know, stories that Jeff was involved in, it's kind of odd that they would have told stories that he wasn't involved in and then been upset that 
those stories got in, but you know, whatever it was, the the problem is though that it it makes the book a little unreliable. There are a lot of great stories in it. I read it again last week, and uh, as I read them, I'm wondering, okay, I I wonder if this is Jeff actually remembering it or Howard Massey filling it in, and some of those things are just factually incorrect. But apart from that, I mean, you know, forgetting what Jeff remembered, there's also the main thing, which is the stuff Jeff actually did. And, Mm. uh, you know, he assisted on many of the early sessions and then took over from Norman Smith as chief engineer in 1966 when they were about to start Revolver. Very first thing he's given as he walks in is tomorrow never knows and john saying he wants to sound like the dalai lama on a distant mountaintop and you know and and he came up with a pretty creative response to that which is to put john's voice through a leslie speaker rotating speaker that's usually used in a hammond organ and otherwise you know closely miking ringo's drums to get a, a little different more you know direct and immediate sound and uh you know he did Revolver, um, brilliant job on that. Uh, and Pepper, of course, he won a Grammy for his engineering on Pepper. The White Album, he quit during because he couldn't stand the tension and arguing. And this is something that's likely to come up. We were saying last week that, um, or last episode, that uh, Giles Martin has been saying that listening to the tapes, he's not sure why everyone says the White Album was so tense and that they didn't get along because they sound like they are on the tapes. They're getting along fine. So he and Jeff would have a difference of opinion, which um, I would have been interested in asking him about in New Jersey. But I guess we won't get to hear any further about that. But um Yeah, and then he returned for Abbey Road and I think did a brilliant engineering job there. That album sounds spectacular. So, Ken? Yeah, well, as far as his book is is concerned, um, it's very possible that Jeff didn't remember a lot from the Beatle years, but I, I seem to think that based on when I interviewed him, which is when the book came out, and subsequent interviews that I've watched online, there are lots of interviews you can find on YouTube mm-hmm. with Jeff. He seems to have pretty vivid memories of when he was the principal engineer from Revolver on and pinpointing certain things that he did on certain songs. And, um, you know, I either he was filled in by the other participants, other engineers and employees at Abbey Road at the, at the time to refresh his memory, uh, I don't really know, but he seemed to come across as though he remembered that part of his career there very well. And certainly, um, I personally feel that Jeff Emmerich came along at the right time in the history of the Beatles. He was the right engineer mm-hmm. to to give the Beatles what they needed at that time as the Beatles were constantly progressing constantly evolving not just in their songwriting but also in production techniques norman smith had just left at the time he wanted to become a producer on his own and who knows if norman had stayed if revolver would have sounded you know the way that it came out with jeff emmerich it could have been a very different album Mm -hmm. he was there to meet the demands of the beatles sometimes you know the thing is he would say that the beatles wouldn't take no for an answer There's no such thing as, no, we can't achieve that. Even if John gave Jeff Emmerich or George Martin instructions, you know, like I want to smell the sawdust on the floor for being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, somehow George Martin, Jeff Emmerich had to interpret that in some way and give John what they think he was hearing in his head. Mm -hmm. So it's remarkable what Jeff Emmerich came up with and George Martin as well. And... Uh, I also uh, recall Jeff Emmerich saying that not only was it very strict at EMI as to what they would allow producers and engineers to do, but they didn't have a lot of equipment there to meet the demands of, of a, certainly of a band like the Beatles that want, wanted to keep growing. They were really designed for classical recordings at EMI, not so much for the pop rock field, even though most of the money that was made came from pop rock. Mm-hmm. Yeah especially from the Beatles. So Jeff was always trying to find different sounds for them 
to meet their needs. And one of the things that I recall him saying, and I think this is a very important part of Jeff's history, is that before he was the principal engineer, he had a, a few different jobs at, at EMI, and he used to remaster um, American albums for the European market. Mm -hmm. uh, he would cite Tamla records, and he would hear how those records sounded and that there was more bass on them and more drums on them. I'm sure that the Beatles themselves were aware of what was going on in America as well, and they wanted more bass and more drums. And so he found ways of achieving that. He talked a lot about using the, um, the Fairchild limiter which really boosted the level of a lot of the instrumentation, the vocals, the drums, the bass, really everything. And he, he fell in love with the limiter, and especially on Revolver. And, and I'm sure he used it quite a lot later on. But without really knowing for sure where it was used, when I hear a song like She Said, She Said, with uh, the opening guitar part just blasting out of the speakers, I'm sure that probably was part of why it sounded the way it did. And he was always looking for ways of achieving different sounds, probably best known for close miking. Hmm. You know, he did that on a lot of uh, Beatles recordings. And not only close miking uh, the instruments, but where he placed the instruments. Much has been said about taking a microphone inside the inside of the tom, uh, a tom-tom drum, you know, removing the... the um, the, the bottom skin and putting a microphone inside of it and covering that up with a towel or something like that. And it created, it, it captured more of the attack on the top of the skin, mm -hmm. the top skin. And, you know, that created a different sound. So when you hear certain songs like A Day in the Life, and a lot of people point to that as, you know, what an amazing drum sound, a lot of that you can contribute to Jeff coming up with those ideas. So, um, you know, he was there, as I said, at the right time in Beatle history when maybe other engineers wouldn't have thought about all these ideas. And, um, you know, also it should be pointed out that because he was working with the biggest band, the biggest artist in the world, EMI allowed him the freedom to do this. And it wasn't easy to get that far. They were very strict on so many policies there, especially with uh, microphone placement he talked about with a bass drum you couldn't place the microphone any closer than 16 inches from the bass and he wanted to move it four inches from the bass drum mm -hmm. it's a big difference right there things like that he eventually was allowed to do not only because the the results were so amazing but because he worked for you know the biggest band in the world you know i'm so, not sure he was really allowed to do it so much as he just did it because that's what he thought it needed, you know, and um, and that was the thing about Jeff. He broke a lot of rules, and he mm -hmm. did so deliberately if he thought that that would achieve the results that the Beatles wanted. And once he did it, and the Beatles liked it, and it came out, and it was selling, EMI wasn't going to say, well, don't do that ever again, <laughs> you know. But, mm. um, but I, I, I'm not sure it was so much a case of them allowing him. I think he he, he kind of just sort of did it without asking. That's kind of the way to do it if you're going to break rules. I have this image uh, of like a comedy uh, skit in my head of, you know, all right, we have to set the organ on fire. So you stand by the door and do watch, okay? And if anyone comes down the hallway, lock the door. <laughs> Because we have to not only set it on fire, but John wants to be under the piano at the time. Yeah. I had the opportunity, like Ken did, to interview Jeff. Uh, I, actually, I'm continuing on here. I, I don't know if you were finished, Ken. I don't mean to interrupt. No, that's fine. Uh, like you, Ken, I interviewed Jeff at WFUV, and I guess it was 2006 when uh, his book Here, There, and Everywhere came out, which he wrote with Howard Massey. And it was a thrill to have him in the studio and, you know, I know that he, Jeff, was largely responsible for a lot of the sounds that we heard on those Beatle records, Revolver, Sgt. Pepper, a little bit of the White Album, Abbey Road. But after the interview was over, and that period is really what gets covered uh, in detail in Jeff's book, having grown up in the 70s, where for mm -hmm. me it was Wings first, and then I figured... 
and I went back and learned about the Beatles, I would see Jeff's name in all the Wings albums because Jeff continued a re working relationship with Paul and uh, was, uh, I guess, an engineer and behind the scenes techie for a lot of the 70s Wings albums. I know for a fact that he was uh, on the yachts when they did London Town. Right. In 77. And, uh, and I wanted to pick his brain about that, but we had run out of time and we had spent it, which I guess was what the goal of the interview was, uh, on, on the Beatles, the late 60s, and what he touched on in his book. Howard Massey did accompany him and was part of the interview. I would have loved to. Have, I, I got the impression that I could not have interviewed Jeff alone. Howard needed to be there and that... Mm -hmm. They had done so many of these interviews, they were actually steering me from topic to topic, song to song. I'm happy to say that the audio of my interview with Jeff Emmerich has been recovered and is now in the audio archives at WFUV's website. So if anyone is interested and they want to go to WFUV.org, you go into... I don't exactly know the layout off the top of my head, but basically look for the archives, audio, video archives. And once you come to the menu, uh, I guess it's the new way of al alphabetizing under G, uh, Jeff Emmerich. <laughs> and you'll be able to listen to uh, the 2006 conversation that I had with Jeff Emmerich and Howard Massey. But um, the other day, I guess it was a few days after he died, uh, I happened to be in the car with a few CDs that I brought some CDs out that have just been around the house and I wanted to give them a listen. And one of them was uh, an Art Garfunkel album called Lefty. Mm -hmm. Lefty came out in the late 80s, I think in 88. And I had completely forgot this. I'm at a red light. I look, glance quickly at the back of the CD case and produced by Jeff Emmerich. And I thought, what, what, what's the chances of that? Mm -hmm. You know, he's on my mind. He, it was a day or two after he passed. Uh, and for those who don't know, Jeff died on October 2nd. And uh, from what I understand now is that he had been he had been hospitalized a couple of weeks before. Uh, but uh, he was having some issues that they uh, thought were dehydration. And then on October 2nd, he he passed of a heart attack at the age of 72. He was also scheduled to be at the Fest for Beatles fans in New Jersey in March because um, wow. he had been at the fest in Chicago this past August and was going to be, it had not been announced yet officially, but was going to be uh, one of the main guests for the fest for Beatles fans 2019 in Jersey city in March. So not only that, but he recently became very involved with social media. He has uh, had a Facebook page. It's, it's probably still up. But he was constantly posting stuff on there. And he, he'd been doing master classes around the country, yes. teaching people, you know, the art of recording in the studio. And, yeah, like you said, he was just at the fest in Chicago. I had heard, actually, I saw on Facebook from Vivek Tawari, who is the author of the graphic novel on Brian Epstein, The Fifth Beetle, which is now being made into a a mini TV series that he was talking to Jeff Emmerich about doing music for that. So he had plans, <laughs> you yeah. know, he was very active. And, uh, I'm, glad uh, you, I'm glad you yeah. mentioned that because I had, I was constantly getting updates on my phone from Facebook and Instagram. Jeff Emmerich is live. Don't miss him now. You know, yeah. and then an hour later, Jeff Emmerich is live again. Uh, so he was very active uh, uh, and it's sudden and you never, course you're never uh, prepared for uh you know when someone passes but this one truly did come out of left field and uh so you know uh, like, like you darren like you darren i had about a half an hour with jeff you can easily go for hours just talking about the oh, Beatles yeah. as a group and you know i really really wanted to talk about his work with paul as a solo artist because I've never actually seen or heard an interview where he goes in depth about that, nor have I even heard or seen Paul talk at length about working with Jeff Emmerich on the solo records. And he did quite a lot with Paul. It wasn't just the Wings period. He continued through all the decades. That's to work right. With 
Yeah. Obviously, yeah. you know, I always like to say where there's George Martin, there's Jeff Emmerich, except on Bad on the Run. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, Tug of War, Pipes of Peace, Broad Street, uh, Flowers in the Dirt on Put It There, Flaming Pie, he's all over Flaming Pie, Unplugged, Good Evening New York City, he has a credit on Memory Almost Full. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of work that he did at all. And, um, you know, I would have loved to have learned more about that. And he did quite a lot of work with other artists, too. After oh, yeah. The Beatles, you know, a lot of people point to Elvis Costello, how much they love Imperial right. Bedroom. One of which, Elvis's um, great albums, yeah. Yeah. Also, Bad all fingers. This Useless Beauty. Yeah. Uh, also, All This Useless Beauty, another Elvis album mm -hmm. uh, that he was involved in. Yeah, and as I mentioned, everyone from Art Garfunkel, he worked with Badfinger, uh, producing part of No Dice. And on the other side of the coin, he produced, uh, or at least worked with the Mahavishnu Orchestra, and in 2004 produced a debut album by uh, singer-songwriter Nellie Mackay uh, called Get Away From Me, which was a very big record on WFUV. So when he did come, I remember this. Uh, when he did come to WFUV, he was thrilled that we were a Nellie Mackay radio station at the time, <laughs> and uh, and that we, you know, were playing a number of tracks from what I think was the first double debut album on Columbia Records since the first Chicago album. Don't hold me to that though, but I think that's what I read back in the day. But mm -hmm. in any event. Rest in peace to Jeff Emmerich. Thank you for all the music and the stories and helping to keep the Beatles' memory front and center uh, in our minds. Uh, Paul did actually acknowledge Jeff the other day. I saw a clip. I don't know where Paul was performing, but Paul did make mention of his friend Jeff Emmerich uh, uh, passing and then did being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. This may have been yesterday or the day before that or maybe last week, but... Obviously, it was recently. Mm. Um, and speaking of Paul, uh, he's on tour. He made an appearance at the Austin City Limits Festival, which was recorded and then broadcast uh, recently on it was on YouTube, I think. And it was also on Red Bull. It was on Facebook Live. And I'm on. sure is sitting somewhere out there in cyberspace. If you want to check out his uh, what I believe was his full performance. Yeah, in Austin, Texas. Professionally done. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. It could be I, I have to, as it is, you know. I'll be kind, but I do have to make mention of the fact that, you know, Paul's voice was not in the greatest shape and uh, at this performance. And he did do Maybe I'm Amazed as if it were the early 70s again. But there were some plenty, uh, plenty of charming moments that completely over overtook those uh, other moments. So look for um, Paul McCartney live, floating around out there from the Austin City Limits Festival. And he was also on 60 Minutes recently, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure you could watch on demand. I think I saw about half or maybe two thirds of the uh, interview uh, when it was broadcast. I guess it was a week and a half ago uh, before we recorded this uh, show. Doesn't it drive you crazy the way people will take something from one of his current interviews and write about it as if it's a brand new thing and then everybody else picks up the same story and writes about it as if it's a brand new thing? I mean, they picked up on the the very beginning of the of the 60 minutes interview where she presents it as shocking news that Paul doesn't read and write music i mean is there anybody <laughs> who didn't know that i mean he's he talks about it all the time <laughs> he really does but you know something in this particular interview he said some things that he said before but they're not the most burnt out stories you know, this whole bit about the one time when John gave him a compliment for one of his songs being here, there, and everywhere, right. that he really liked that one. He said that before. Sure. But not to the billionth degree that he's talked about, hey, Jude, or I saw her standing there, or how we dreamed yesterday. That's not one of those things that, that Paul has brought up time and time again. He also mentioned something which, you know, it's not all that shocking. 
But um, I think it's from the last time that the Beatles were photographed together, the photographs that Linda took. There's a few photos of, um, well, all of them. But I think uh, with John, where he's looking a little bit grumpy, and Paul said that's because he was thinking about his tax situation at the time. So I never heard Paul ever say that before. So that was something new. <laughs> so that jumped at me. But, you know, just saying certain things like he, Paul, still wants to be liked, that he's insecure, that John was insecure. He also brought up the whole bit about John once said to him, How, do you think that I'll be remembered well? You know, and Paul was in shock. Of course, you're going to be remembered well. People love you. You know, but the fact that John actually asked him that question, Paul has talked about this a few times before, but like I said, it's not one of those worn out stories. Mm -hmm. So it was somewhat refreshing, this interview, although I, I sure wish that they wouldn't be just, you know, all Beatle questions. I, uh, I thought it was one of the better interviews I've seen because they're, they all seem to be fluff pieces. And I mean, when he was on Jimmy Fallon, it was just jokes and goofs and and I want little substance in these interviews and there was some as serious moments that you don't normally hear when you know he's on other interview programs and he's gonna it's a total of five minutes so they'll tell some jokes and you know there have been some recent ones that have been substantial. I mean, the GQ one was the um, there was a long NME one as well. Um, with the GQ one, I mean, the same thing happened. Someone picked up on something that again wasn't news, which was the you know group masturbation story. Which mm. you know, John wrote that as part of a play. It's a, there's a scene in O Calcutta that he wrote, and what Paul was saying was pretty much exactly the script of that section of O Calcutta, which is around. You can find it on YouTube. So, uh, but again, big news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now that we're into the fall season and all the exciting music releases are coming out, there is no uh, shortage of things to talk about in Beatleland. And it all started with Paul McCartney's new album, Egypt Station, coming out about a little over a month ago and i saw the other day that on record store day there will be a seven inch vinyl single of uh come on to me and uh i don't know so uh you know we're going to probably continue to hear about egypt station for the remainder of the year and we know what's coming in a matter of weeks and that is the big white album uh box 50th anniversary uh uh, campaign of reissues uh, uh, around the White Album. That'll be in early November. But right now, it's all John Lennon at the moment. He just celebrated a birthday, and we have the release of an exhaustive look on his 1971 album, Imagine, John's second post-Beatles album, which is the subject of a box set and also other audio configurations to go along with the box set uh plus uh dvd slash blu-ray of two films uh involving uh, and about imagine and a book but at the center of all of this of course obviously is the box set and all of the uh material that is uh, uh newly released skeptics will say how many times are they going to reissue the same thing and we've had several imagine reissues in the past but never anything of this size and the timing of it is a little strange uh, in that there aren't any key anniversaries with Imagine. The album did come out in the fall, September, October 1971. But that's what? Help me with the math here. 47 years? Mm -hmm. 47 years. So it's not a round anniversary. Does that mean in three years there'll be another Imagine box set? I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but the timing around John's birthday... And uh, the rough uh, release date, we have this uh, detailed look at uh, the Imagine album. So first off, the configurations. And this always gets a little confusing with any artist when they do these big mega reissues. Uh, there's not just one edition. There's a half dozen that you have to choose from. Which one gives you more bang for your buck? If you're a completist like me, you want all of them 
Now I have 15 different versions of the same thing. In the case of Imagine, it's available as what's referred to as the ultimate collection. That's the super deluxe box set, which in total is a six disc set, uh, four CDs and two Blu-ray, I guess Blu-ray audio discs. Uh, and the box set comes with a 120 page book. And uh, that is the mother load for Imagine. Scale it back a bit. Imagine's also available as what is referred to as the ultimate mixes. And first up, you have the deluxe double CD, which I guess it's safe to say is the box set whittled down to two discs and a 20 page book. And there's also a one CD edition of the ultimate mixes, which is um, the new mix of Imagine, the original album with bonus tracks and none of the extras in you know, none of the uh, alternate takes, uh, demos, outtakes, and whatnot, and different surround sound mixes. Those are not, of course, part of the one CD set. Then, of course, vinyl. The ultimate mix is available in not one, but two double album packages. The black vinyl, which is 180 gram vinyl, or the clear vinyl uh, edition, which is not 180 gram vinyl. And uh, then there's the book and the Blu-ray and the DVD, which we'll get to at some point later in the show or in the next show. But for now, let's concentrate on the big mother load of Imagine Sessions now out as part of this box set. I had, do not have the box set at the time when we record this, but have uh, read and seen plenty of it. Let's get... Uh, Ken and Alan, your takes on uh, what you've seen and heard so far. Well, first of all, I don't have the physical box set, but I have all the audio tracks. And that's what I've been spending all my time listening to, strictly the audio. And I've listened to the audio of the first four CDs. The, the Blu-ray audio, you should point out, is really everything that's on those four CDs crammed into two discs. And there's also an interview that Elliot Mintz did with John Lennon. Um, and, okay. what, and what else, Alan? Well, okay. On the two Blu-rays, what you get are a 5.1 mix of the whole album and then a 5.1 mix of all of the related singles, Power to the People, uh, Well, Baby, Please Don't Go, which wasn't a single. In fact, we hadn't had a studio version of that before. Uh, that was the track he opened his set with Frank Zappa and the mothers at Fillmore East with. Um, and that's an, you know, an oldie that he just picked up from his Liverpool days. Then God Gosh. save us and do the Oz and God save Oz, which was the original. Well, it was originally God save us. Then it was God save Oz. Then they realized that that wouldn't mean anything to American listeners um, so they change it back to God Save Us. But both versions of the song are here. Uh, and then Happy Christmas War is Over. That's on the first Blu-ray, which then continues with the 1971 quad mix of Imagine. <laughs> and then... Can I jump in here one second, Alan? Mm -hmm. What is the difference, if there is one, on a quadraphonic mix, or what is referred to in this box set as a 4.0 quadrasonic <laughs> right mix. is um, there a difference yeah yeah the quad mix was basically the one that john oversaw in 1971 so it's a different mix than the 5.1 um which was done by um i think rob stevens and paul hicks uh, so the 5.1 is new, plus it has, you know, the center channel and the subwoofer. Uh, so it's, you know, uh, spread around a little more. And I think that, you know, in 1971, quad was a kind of experimental thing that never really took off. It says in the book that comes with the set that John at first had no interest in doing a quad mix. I mean, we're talking about a guy who, you know, go, I think he wore a back to mono button through a lot of his life. Uh -huh. um, but then they played him a Guess Who album that was done in quad and he liked it. So he went into 
the record plant and uh, and oversaw this mix but you know they've learned an awful lot about surround sound mixing between 1971 and now so the 5.1 mix just sounds a lot more modern and clean and transparent I, I i found the quad mix sounded a little bit you know muddy and i think with quad there was a little more idea of putting separate things in different places in the, the quad mix you know coming out of different speakers because it was at the time kind of a novelty um mm -hmm. whereas with 5.1 they also want to surround you with a kind of realistic sort of sound picture but i love the fact that they gave you the quad mix i mean really if paul was going to go back and and redo his archival band on the run that would be a good idea to because that came out in a quad mix at the time too so i, I i'd love to hear some of these other beatles related quad mixes some of which have been bootlegged by the way but so but okay there isn't there mm -hmm. isn't a difference between the quadrasonic and quadraphonic? No, it must just be what EMI was calling their version of quadraphonic, okay. you know. Because I'd always heard quadraphonic, and I noticed here with the, in the Imagine and all of the notes, they refer to it as quadrasonic. Anyway. Yeah, yeah that so. just must be what EMI was calling it at the time. Uh, you know, I thought it was going to be, I, yeah. I thought I had another stereo system I had to buy. No. Yeah. Uh, and then we're still on the first Blu ray. Uh, then there are a bunch of the outtakes, starting with the Imagine demo and going all through. Second Blu ray, we get more, uh, okay what they call raw studio mixes, extended album versions. Okay, so you're getting the album in order as it, you know, plays in the regular version of the album, except that it includes some of the count-ins and where there was a fade, they take it to the end of the actual track. So it's kind of the Imagine album, but with some extras on the top and tail, you know? Mm -hmm. Then more uh, raw studio mixes outtakes, which are, you know, more of the outtakes, but I think they're a little bit extended beyond what you hear on the CDs. You know, again, a couple of seconds of intro or counting or whatever. Okay, then elements mixes. What elements mixes is, is say, imagine strings only, crippled inside upright bass and drums, jealous guy, piano, bass, and, and drums. Uh, it's so hard, strings only. So in other words, stuff that you don't normally focus on when you hear the whole track, uh, in a lot of cases, the string overdubs, uh, you're hearing these on their own. And I think those, okay, those are in stereo and 5.1, so you have a choice there. And then there is the evolution discography, uh, sorry, documentary, which we also have on CD4. You know, it goes from the, in a lot of cases, from the demo all the way through the finished song, you know, in, in a, a gradual evolution, you know, you, you hear it start and stop and all that, but there's no voiceover saying, now they go on to take two or anything like that. It just develops. And by the mm -hmm. end of the track, you get the song. And then the only other thing on the Blu-ray is the uh, John and Yoko Elliott Mintz interviews, which are not on the CDs. So there's actually quite a lot of stuff on the Blu-ray that you're only getting on the Blu-ray. And that's kind of interesting because they're taking Blu-ray seriously as an audio format. You know, and that's, uh, they are on the uh, White Album release, too. You'll find the same thing. The, the mono White Album will only be on the Blu-ray. So you just said something interesting there, Alan, about um, the strings only uh, for the elements uh, that are featured. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned It's So Hard, which is not on the CD. The second, yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, there's more. Yeah. For the elements mixes, I think they have, they have every single track on the album. Whereas on the elements mixes on CD two, there are only four of them. Right. Yeah. Cause I was wondering when I was listening to this, obviously there's a lot of great orchestration throughout the album, but my first thought would be, how do you sleep? Yeah. You got to hear the strings on how do you sleep? 
And yeah. that's not one of the four right. that's on that disc. And, so, and here on the uh, Blu-ray, it is just the strings of How Do You Sleep. Just exactly mm. what you want, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll have to get 5.1 then. Absolutely. Ken and I... Uh, and I, uh, Alan, do you have the physical box at the time that we recorded the show? Do you have the box? Yep. You have it. Okay. So yes. Ken and I don't, we have the audio files, but, uh, I, I guess you do. Do you have the two CD set, Ken? Yes, I do. Yeah. All right. I'm looking at the two CD set and it really is, uh, I guess while I'm listening to Alan, I'm realized the second disc and the two CD set sort of is uh, a summarization of all of these other mixes that Alan was elaborating on because disc two of the two CD set opens with four elements mixes. Mm -hmm. Right. So what what do you, what do you have on the two CD set? It basically is is disc two of, of the four. Yeah. Yeah. It's disc one and two of the four CDs that are in the box set. It's the same first two discs. I just was thought to myself, we, break into Alan's house and scramble the six <laughs> CDs up out of order, right? Uh, and then, all right, Alan, play me. How do you sleep? Uh, <laughs> Elements Mix, take seven. Um, you know, and, and listening to the Elements Mixes, when you hear the strings, I was thinking, hey, this is really the first time we're truly hearing the Flux Fiddlers by themselves. Right. Mm. You know, uh, John's name for the string section that they use on Imagine and here are the ele- elements mixes. I know from the two CDs uh, a set, uh, it starts off disc two with Imagine Elements Mix. That's the orchestration. And I'm thinking, there they are, the Flux Fiddlers, you know, taking center stage. You know, Go what? Ahead, as I listen to all this stuff and watch the videos and read the book and all that, I kind of came away with this idea that what I wish Yoko had done, you know, and it's not like she hasn't done eight gazillion things in this release already, but you know how she did Double Fantasy, the stripped down mix? Mm-hmm. I kind of wish, you know, listening to the outtakes, it kind of occurred to me that, you know, I liked a lot of these songs better without the strings. The string arrangements are really nice, but they bury some of the band playing. And, Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I, I really began to think, you know, I, I, I'd like to hear this whole album without the strings. I think it would be a good idea, you know. So maybe uh, when she in 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 twenty twenty one, when it is the fiftieth anniversary, she that's when we'll get the stripped down. Uh, <laughs> imagine. Uh, I'm glad you pointed that out because while I was listening to the two CD edition. Uh, and listening to the second disc, which is the sampling of all these cool takes, I couldn't help but think about drummer Alan White of Yes. Mm-hmm. Must be loving this yeah. because his playing is 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 simple but excellent, and the mix has the drums right up front. Mm-hmm. And Kim and Klaus Warman on bass made a formidable rhythm section, which does get lost on the. Uh, standard version of Imagine with the production and the strings and and whatnot. And yet at the same time, when you've got the isolated strings, you realize how much work was put into that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the one thing, I mean, I'm impressed by all of it, but the song How, which has now emerged as one of my favorite solo John Lennon songs, if you listen to the strings only, which is on disc two, that stands by itself as a piece of music. It really is just a gorgeous piece of music by itself with nothing else. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I understand what you're saying about how the strings can somehow, you know, uh, maybe overshadow uh, or or you don't you don't hear the band fully because of the strings. When you just got the band and nothing else, it has a whole different vibe to it. It has more of a live raw sound, which is, you know, what it should have. And um, it also makes you realize what a great band this was. And, you know, that's another thing that I take away from listening to all this and all these different takes and isolated tracks that you get to hear. All these musicians complimented John so well. Some of my favorite parts of this album are listening to what Nicky Hopkins brought to it. Oh, yeah. yep. what, he, what he played on Jealous Guy 
I mean, I always knew that I loved his, his piano part and Jealous Guy. When it's isolated by itself and when you hear different takes, when he's playing something different, it's just perfect for the song. And um, likewise, that there was a, a take of Crippled Inside where you, where you hear Nikki's playing right there and it's got that honky-tonk feel to it. And it's just so right for the song. And, and most of all, and I, you know, we can go back to the original Imagine album, with How Do You Sleep, and that's a song that I can listen to every take and never get tired of it. What Nicky Hopkins brought to that song, especially in the way that it ends with how he improvises, everything is just so right, you know, and tasteful, you know, without overshadowing other musicians in the group. This is a band where everybody complimented each other so well. This is a band that I would have loved to have seen on the road. I mean, like you said, Toronto was this band without Nicky Hopkins, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, this would have been a killer band to see. But um, part of the reason why I love this album is because of the musicians that are on it. And, um, you know, when you break everything down and hear what each one contributed, there are times when in the, the new remix, you hear more of Klaus's bass and what he mm-hmm. contributed. And you realize how great his bass playing was. You realize how great Alan White's drumming was. It's um, it's so wonderful in so many aspects in the box set. Mm-hmm. And you also really get to appreciate some of George's finest uh, slide playing, uh, I think, that he right. ever that he ever did i mean it was like he was so inspired playing uh those sessions uh and you hear the different takes in the box set and you know one solo is better than the next and it's like it was amazing to uh, to hear uh, other you know variations of uh, the slide solos uh, mm. and john's vocals on some of these alternate takes with all of the excesses stripped away you re- and, and all of the uh, the density that would be put on the finished albums of John's. He always loved to doctor up his voice because he didn't like it. Well, here you're getting John as he sounded in the studio pre-strings and pre-Spectre's wall of sound. And it, puts, it gives you chills. Mm-hmm. I think if Yoko had had her way all along, John would never have had reverb on his voice (laughs) because Yoko just loved John's voice the way it was, as we all do. And just hearing his voice raw was so powerful. But he had an honest voice. He had, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When he, when his voice cracked, which it does from time to time, I think to myself, I wish my voice would crack like that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, (laughs) And there are those moments where in the sessions you're listening to these, like, a, again, a fly on the wall type deal with this box set. And you hear the raw, honest power of John's vocal, including the occasional crack uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, would would have, I guess, been taken off the finished studio version that would come out on, on the albums. But so the box set is uh, brings um brought to my mind a question can we anticipate this being the beginning of an ongoing series of deluxe reissues of john's albums a la mccartney's archive collection and what many bands are doing today not just reissuing classic albums with a handful of outtakes but actually giving you 15 discs of uh, of everything that exists in these mega sets. I wonder if Imagine is the beginning of a reissue campaign that's going to uh, go over the next few years where we'll get Plastic Ono Band, perhaps the expanded and improved uh, one-to-one concert. One-to-one concert is in the works. Yeah, well, No, we know that, but yeah. that could also you know, kind of be absorbed into this Lennon reissue campaign, which uh, would be, I guess, a good reason to once again reissue all of this music. You know, Darren, that may actually be the answer to the question of the timing, you know, because this is not an even-numbered anniversary for Imagine. It's not an even-numbered anniversary of John's birth. So 
what's the rationale? And maybe the rationale is that by putting out Imagine Now on a non-anniversary, she's made it possible to just put out any of these albums at will, not have to wait for an anniversary, just, you know, whenever she feels that the time is right. And I, I right. hope you're. I hope you're right. I hope it is an ongoing series because I'd love to hear. Well, you know what? A lot of these things, including a lot of the Imagine things. I mean, there have been gazillions of John Lennon studio bootlegs. A lot of Imagine mm -hmm. stuff is out. A lot of Plastic Ono band stuff is out. But I would love to hear it in, you know, an official way with the. Blu-rays with surround mixes and more extensive mixes. I, I should mention on the Blu-ray too, there is uh, one other outtake that just isn't on any of the audio ones, which is a 1969 recording from Bermuda of O Yoko. No, that's on there. That's on there? It's Where? on there. Which disc? It's on... It's on the two CD. Oh yeah, it is. It's on CD too. Yeah. Huh. So it's yeah. even on the two CD version. <laughs> okay. And, when I heard it on the Blu-ray, I thought, "Wow, that's kind of cool." It's not on the. <laughs> yeah. In fact, when Darren and I got to see the um, video for Imagine um, in a small theater in New York City, uh, which I don't know if we'll be talking about in this show or in the next show, they had bonus footage at the very end. Mm -hmm. of John singing O oh, Yoko in this hotel with Yoko and Derek Taylor was there in the room. Hmm. So that's where it's from. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, they tagged on these little bonus clips to the end of the Imagine film and that kind of ties the video release, the DVD Blu-ray in with the the box set. They're separate, completely separate items, but the connection there is the fact that the imagined film has bonus material at the end that kind of gives you the video of a few of the tracks that we're talking about that exist in audio form on the box set. Now, right. if somebody could explain to me what I just said, um, <laughs> yeah. I would appreciate it because I'm very confused. Do you know how many notes that this imagined box set has, has this paper all over the table here uh, mm -hmm. of mix, take this, uh, element that, but um, I think it's safe to say that we're all, as time goes by, the weeks and months to come, we'll be spending considerable time uh, on uh, the Imagine set, uh, and probably we could do several shows on the audio part alone. So any more thoughts on the uh, deluxe box set, um, Alan or Ken or both of you in two-part harmony? <laughs> I will defer well, to Ken. <laughs> I just like the way the whole thing was put together, just speaking on the four discs, the way everything was separated, the way that it was, and the way that it was presented. You know, I don't know how anyone can possibly complain at all about this box set, unless you're one of those people, and I know that there are some of them out there, that want every take of every song. And I'm also wondering how many people listening to this show and how many Beatles fans are actually going to take every single imagine take that spread out through all of these discs and then group them together and then take all the crippled insides and put them together and all the jealous guys and put them together i like the way that it's all laid out the fact that you have a remixed album first the second disc you've got like we were talking about the elements that we mentioned the strings only for imagine and jealous guy john's vocals alone for oh my love and the strings on how and then you've got all these other different takes of the songs, and they are good in their own way. It's just very refreshing. It's just like you can say this about Beatles recordings. You're so used to hearing the actual recordings as they were released that to hear any any different recordings that have any variance whatsoever, you know, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. And it's nice it's nice to have crippled inside with a different slide guitar solo from George. Mm -hmm. Whether it's better or not than the release version isn't really that relevant. It's just something that's different. It's cool to have a different take altogether of that. Then there's also the whole disc three, where you have a lot of what really are the release takes that were on the album without strings or without certain key parts of the song. 
like uh, Give Me Some Truth without George's sly guitar in there. It has a different feel without it. You know, it's just very clever the way that was done. It's interesting also to hear, this was not a, a an album where I saw a tremendous evolution of the song where there were really big differences in the arrangements from start to finish. But with I Don't Want to Be a Soldier, it definitely was. They tried different arrangements of that song, and you got to hear that spread out through these discs. I also love, well, I love the whole idea of disc four with the commentaries. I only wish that there was uh, an interview that, that John gave for every song on Imagine. There's only select ones, like Imagine and Crippled Inside and Jealous Sky and How Do You Sleep. I also thought it was pretty interesting. I wanted to get you guys your opinion on what John said about How Do You Sleep, because he did say in this interview, it's, it's a shame that all the attention went to who the song was about. And then John said, well, you know, it was also about me. Yeah, he always said well, that about his angry songs later, after you know, a couple of years have elapsed. He said it about Steel and Glass, too, which was clearly about Klein. So you don't think it could be about both? Well, I mean, maybe, but, you know, that way, you know, when you start off saying Sergeant Pepper took you by surprise and the only thing you done was yesterday and a pretty face may last a year or two, but soon they'll see what you can do. Uh, and you must have learned something after all these years. It, it's very clear who he's talking to. And when the album was new, he was totally straightforward about that. He said, yeah, you know, listen to Ram, listen to too many people. This is just a response to that. Paul was more subtle, I'm more direct. And right. then, you know, years later, it's, well, you know, it's also about me. Well, you know, it's not really... <laughs> <laughs> what happens in the heat of the moment he writes the song five years later when he's calmed down it's like you know no 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 it's 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 about me yeah. mm -hmm. well the line jump when your mama tell you anything could that have been about john well that no that, that did next have that residence yeah. you know so i suppose it's possible but mm -hmm. we know that at least most of it was about paul but, um, yeah, I do wish that on that disc that there would be an interview for each song that would have made it even more special. But um, there's so many great moments spread out on all four discs. I do want to bring up that there's a, a great alternate take of Power to the People, mm -hmm. which has an introduction to it with a saxophone, which could have worked just as well, uh, releasing that in 1971, I think, as the single itself. And then there's the remix of the version that came out in 1971, which has more vocals in the very beginning when everybody's singing the chorus. It's really amazing, the full sound that you hear at the very beginning of Power to the People. And if you're uh, the person who was, eh, with the song, I Don't Want to Be a Soldier, Mama, I know that tends to be a tune that a lot of people think could have been left off Imagine. Listen to it, uh, listen to the different mixes, and uh, that's a killer song uh and it really works again in the stripped down fashion when you're hearing the different takes mm -hmm. uh, of i don't want to be a soldier mama i don't want to die right and in one of the one of the tracks on that john is actually instructing king curtis how to play the sax to start off with this really high note and then just go wild it's just interesting to hear that to hear what they're saying in the studio as the song yeah. is developing mm -hmm. and shaping like that there's also a moment in there, I think it's on the, yeah, it's probably the audio the commentary, where uh, they're talking about how do you sleep, and John said to Nikki Hopkins, I want you to give me like the sound of The Thrill is Gone from B.B. King, mm -hmm. which I found very interesting. It's just very insightful. That was what was in John's mind at the time. That's interesting. You know? Yeah. So, you know, you get these, these uh, little insightful things. When you listen to the rehearsals, there were times actually on that fourth disc where it really sounded like a bootleg. It was so loose. Yeah. And there'd be moments there when there was like dead air, <laughs> you know, or you can faintly hear the musicians talking to each other. And I'm kind of shocked that it went out like that. Any uh, thoughts, Alan? Uh, additional well, I, I, I love when legitimate releases aspire to the spirit of bootlegs. Um, because that's mm -hmm. what I live for. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, what what Ken said is he pretty much, I think, captured a lot of my feelings, too. I mean, I just love getting all these outtakes. I, I'm one of those people, Ken referred to, who wants every single take of everything. Um, but I'm happy with this set. Uh, a lot of the out, a few of the outtakes I think we've heard on bootlegs over the years, but an awful lot of them we haven't. And, you know, every outtake tells you something, you know, it's not just a somewhat sloppier take than what was released. It's, it, it's a take where they're on the way and they're trying things. And I especially like that take five and six of How Do You Sleep? Uh, which Yoko released a video of online, but hasn't put on any of these releases, the video. Uh, she's given us the audio on the set. Um, the video, I thought, was really revealing because it, it's showing, you know, how everybody is is playing this thing. And I guess as a guitarist, I was fascinated by the way George switched from finger picking to using a pick by keeping the pick between two of his fingers and then just doing this quick hand maneuver to, to grab the pick. I realize that this isn't something that will float everybody's boat, but as a guitarist myself, it, it, it kind of was fascinating for me to watch. Uh, Ken, you say that you would have liked interviews from John about each of the tracks. And mm -hmm. so I guess to perhaps preview slightly the show where we talk about the book, you want the book because <laughs> the book the book includes John's thoughts about every single track and lots of other people's thoughts in, in, in a lot of cases too. The book to me, you know, when I, I approached it as like, okay, it's just a book of this stuff. But when I finished reading it, the book to me was the key to everything. It explains a lot of stuff that you hear on these audio recordings. It explains an awful lot of the stuff that you see in the two video productions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, just for instance, you know, when I've always watched the Imagine film and also Give Me Some Truth, you see a lot of people walking in and out of frame and, you know, they're just, you don't really think about who they are. They're just people, you know, almost as if they're extras. You read the book you can identify absolutely everybody in both of those films and you know who they are, what they do. They have a backstory, they have some depth and it completely changes the way you see those two films. So I would advocate getting your hands on the book. Oh, I plan on getting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I wanted to just comment on something that you were asking Darren, and I'm really hoping that this will lead to, similar treatments to albums like Mind Games and Walls and Bridges, mm -hmm. maybe sometime in New York City. But also, you got to be aware of the fact that Yoko is now 85, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't know if she'll be able to keep working on these projects. You know, it's, it's a lot of work putting all this together. I'm sure that uh, if this is to be the beginning of a new reissue campaign of Lennon's music, I'm sure that uh, the plan, a, a rough plan, has been put into place for after, I, you know, yeah. I don't want to say it. Yeah, but, I think she trusts yeah. Rob Stevens, her her principal engineer, for quite a few projects now. And, and there's Sean, you know, I, I think Darren's probably right. You know, she probably has mapped out a lot of what she wants to do and maybe trusting them to find which outtakes to include, you know. Mm -hmm. Sort of like George's brainwashed album when the writing was on the wall, when it was obvious that his health was not going to improve, you know, uh, the blueprints for the album were handed over to Danny and, and Jeff Lynn. And, you know, when the time comes after I'm gone, this is what I want everything to sound like. So I'm sure okay. that that plan is in place. If, in fact, we're correct in our thoughts that perhaps this reissue of Imagine is the beginning of um, a new reissue campaign. And I refer to it as a new one because around the uh, very late 90s and into the early 2000s, uh, John's catalog was remixed and reissued all of the albums. And with each reissue, some of those remixes were getting pretty, were getting pretty uh, severe in so much that there were changes actually being made to the sounds of those. Mm -hmm. 
releases. And that reissue campaign started with Imagine. Right. And then with each subsequent album, it seemed as though Yoko took more and more liberties in remixing the music and even the packaging, changing the packaging. Yeah. And then yeah. all of John's albums got re-released again, where they reverted back to the original mixes as they sounded when they were first issued. John's Masters. Right. Mm -hmm. The Han Solo shoots first we, version. <laughs> now perhaps we have number three, the third campaign. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Time will tell. And it's nice that you have these choices. If you just want the same original mixes, you can go right back to the 2010 remasters if you want to. Mm -hmm. Or you can go to the remixes of the 2000s, or you can go to this. So, imagine. so. Answer, answer this question. Imagine's been remixed again, which means if this is the second time the album's been remixed to that. Well, then I guess it was 1999 maybe 2000, when the first remix of Imagine came out. Now it's been remixed again in this box set. Uh, so this would be the second time the mix was redone. Am I correct? I guess so. And the Imagine album, she stayed, if I remember correctly, the, the, the first remix, she stayed fairly faithful to the original uh, the original album and liberties she would take with... Uh, where you would notice changes, starting with Plastic Ono Band, Walls and Bridges, Mind Games. In listening to the album, this current remix within the box set, when the album is presented to you as, here is Imagine, released in 1971, but it's a new mix, do you hear anything different there, or does it play like just a clean version of what you heard back in 71? To, hmm. to me, it played like a clean version, but I haven't really sat down with the three mixes we now have and compared them. It might be, there might be, uh, you know, a number of differences that stand out once I do that. Mm -hmm. But I haven't done it. Yeah, yeah I, I always felt the 2000 or, again, 1999 or whatever reissue, with the remi that remix was faithful to the original and it was the future reissues of the other catalog albums where yoko was allowing some liberties to be taken with you know how the songs sounded how they were mixed and even how they they looked mm -hmm. i have to go back to the to the the first remix and listen to it again from what i recall the one thing that stood out for me was that i heard a bit more bass from klaus Vormann listening to to that remix but um i just think that with the new remix i hear the instrumentation with much more clarity to it. You know, it, I, I've written down for each song on the album what I hear that I didn't hear before, and it usually comes down to more bass, the drums are more crisp. You know, it, it, you can just single out all the different instrumentation and hear it much clearer overall. So, um, but I still need to go back to the first remix to really compare it. So uh, those will be the things we will discuss in part eight of uh, Imagine on things we said today. Mm. So hopefully, hopefully we didn't confuse you more and we helped sort out a little bit of uh, the reissue of John's 1971 album, Imagine, John Lennon and the Plastic Ono Band with the Flux Fiddlers. And again, as I mentioned earlier in this show, Imagine now available as a six CD box set, uh, which is four CDs and two Blu-ray audio discs. And uh, also you can go for the more scaled down two CD set or simply go for the new 2018 mix of Imagine as a single CD with some bonus tracks included, or go the route of the vinyl, black vinyl, clear vinyl, your choice. And uh, that is the 2018 presentation of the album Imagine. So we spent a considerable amount of time on the audio. What we will do in the next edition of Things We Said Today is uh, talk about uh, the book and the DVD and Blu-ray release which includes two films, John and Yoko's 1972 film, Imagine, and Give Me Some Truth. That's the documentary on the making of Imagine. And perhaps 
Alan or Ken would uh, also give us their brief renditions of a sampling of tracks from Yoko's Fly album. Um, um, I understand that uh, Alan does uh, do a fine interpretation of a few of the tracks on that album, but Fly was recorded at the same time as Imagine. So perhaps in the next show, uh, we may briefly touch on that. And of course, the White Album's coming up, so we pretty much have our future plan here on things we said today. <laughs> so and, and uh, possibly and possibly the McCartney remaster is in December. Yes, absolutely. Those uh, supposedly are happening in early December. Two two Wings albums to be uh, reissued in deluxe fashion: Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway. Yeah, so, and, and, and I think they have a date. I think it might be December seventh. That's what I've heard. So, so, and as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, I don't know. And come on to me, coming out on uh, seven inch vinyl on Record Store Day, and we have Traveling Wilbury's picture disc coming out. Oh, anyway, stick with us, and we'll uh, kind of walk you through the whole thing. This is Things We Said Today. I'm Darren DeVivo, the new guy on the block from WFUV. And uh, you can reach me, if you'd like, uh, by emailing me at WFUV. The email address is Darren DeVivo, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O, at WFUV.org. Or go to Facebook and like my radio broadcasting page, which is Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. That is the full name of the page. That's the one you want. And, of course, you could contact me also through uh, the things we said today, uh, uh, cyber thingies. Alan? Okay. Uh, the easiest way to get to me is through Facebook, uh, just either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, there is also the things we said today, cyber thing that Darren just mentioned, which is our email address. Uh, things we said today, radio show, all one word, at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter at, at things we said fab. And there is a Facebook page, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. So we all look at all of those. So right away. Captain That's a Paul McCartney song. That's a Paul McCartney <laughs> Yes, that was a little in-joke there. <laughs> <laughs> Before I get my contact info, I just wanted to make a quick mention. Alan, uh, earlier you mentioned the song, Baby, Please Don't Go. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but... This is not the first time it's been released, the studio version, because it came out on the John Lennon Anthology box set. Oh, yeah. What, I, what I've been meaning to do is I wanted to kind of A-B the anthology box and see if any of these alternate takes that are on the new Imagine box set are the same ones that are in the anthology. There might be a few, but that would certainly be interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, if you want to contact me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. A few things about my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. I have a brand new interview that I did with two guys who are drummers, and uh, their names are Alex Kane and Terry McCusker. A couple of years ago, they put out a book called Ringo Starr and the Beatles Beat, and it's a very thorough analysis of Ringo's drumming and what it brought to the Beatles recordings, his innovation as a drummer, and they would select certain uh, passages in Beatles songs and notate them and show you what Ringo did on the drums and what percussion was used at the same time and what made Ringo's drumming and his skills there enhance those songs. And so I did an interview with those two guys. It's on my website. It's on a page called Interviews, page four. And it's about an hour of conversation. If you're into that whole thing about Ringo's drumming and how special it was in the Beatle days, uh, go to that page. I also have a Beatles trivia and games page. And every week you can win one of nine prizes. And they're all great prizes from books to CDs to DVDs. And just recently as one of the prizes, I added Paul McCartney's new CD called Egypt Station. And I now have the double CD of Imagine Ultimate Mixes Deluxe, which we just talked about. It's really the first two discs of the four that you'll find on the Imagine box set. 
and both McCartney and the Lennon, courtesy of Universal Music. You can win that as part of my uh, weekly Beatles trivia. And one more thing, and that's that brand new show that I'm a part of. It's mainly on the solo Beatles careers. It's called Talk More Talk. And every other Tuesday night, usually at either 9 or 10 p.m. Eastern, it's a live broadcast with myself, Kid O'Toole, Ken Womack, and Tom Hunyadi talking about, in most cases, uh, the solo careers of the Beatles. And um, you can find, you can actually watch the video broadcast of it on our Facebook page, which is Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. After the live broadcast, in which you can actually comment as the show is going on, after the live broadcast, it stays on the Facebook page. It also is on YouTube as well. So far, we've done uh, three episodes, and it's every other week, just like things we said today is. So um, if you want to hear a great conversation about the solo careers of the Beatles, and very often, especially when there's new releases like there are now, you'll find that this show and Talk More Talk, we're talking about the same releases but, you know, it's it's interesting to get different perspectives from different people. And uh, everybody has something worthwhile to say on these subjects. So um, we just did a show on Imagine and Jeff Emmerich, just like we did here. And um, I think once the new releases die down, once January rolls in, we'll have different topics on both shows. But um, if you can, check out the show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast on Facebook and also on YouTube. There, I'm done. <laughs> That's All an right. hour and a half. <laughs> it is. Well, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Ken. And don't forget, we'll be back in two weeks with the next things we said today. I'm Darren DeVivo. And uh, enjoy Imagine. Imagine.